It took me longer than I had planned to get through chapter one, but that's okay. I think in uh, some coming chapters we'll pick up the pace a little bit. But um, and then last Wednesday night, kind of focused in in verse 23 on the issue of being born again and uh, didn't even really look at all of verse 23, just kind of focused in on that issue of being born again as it applies doctrinally uh, to individual Jews under the gospel of the kingdom and to Israel as a nation at the second coming of Christ. And we looked at the different passages that concern the issue. We also saw that although the Apostle Paul did not use that exact term, born again, he certainly taught in his epistles that believers in this present age receive a new birth upon salvation. We are regenerated, Titus 3 verse 5. Uh, so it's the same principle, but based on a different message with some different results. Okay. And um, by the way, the only way for any sinner in any age uh, to become a child of God is to be born of the Spirit of God. Okay, And that happens after the cross based on what Christ accomplished. But I believe in this present age, you and I who are saved by believing the gospel, the grace of God, are born after the Spirit as it says in Galatians 4. We are spiritually regenerated as I already mentioned Titus 3 verse 5. Of course, in the future 70th week of Daniel, the uh, believing remnant of Israel, those individual believing Jews will be born again, and then the nation itself will be born again at the second coming. And so, um, you know, when we think about the blood of Christ, for an example, well, we're redeemed by the blood of Christ. Israel will be redeemed by the blood of Christ. Now, there's some distinction in terms of application Paul said, we have now received the atonement. Israel is looking for that day of atonement at the second coming, nationally speaking. So, the dispensational distinctions do not do away with some of the principal connections. Okay, And so, this issue of being born again, that's what we focused in on last time. Uh, in the passage that we're going to consider this evening, uh, the Apostle Peter draws a stark contrast between the Word of God and the flesh. You'll see that very clearly. Let's begin reading in verse 22 because verse 22 to 25 is one sentence. Or excuse me, yeah, yeah, one sentence. Verse 22 to 25 and then we'll go on into the first three, chap uh, first three chapters of chapter 2. How about that? Rough start, man. <laughs> the first three verses of chapter 2. All right, here we go. Let's just read it, and then we'll come back and work through it, okay? Uh, 1 Peter 1, 22. Seeing you have purified your souls and obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the Word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But, what a contrast, the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Wherefore, laying aside all malice, and all guile, and hypocrisies, and envies, and all evil speakings, as newborn babes, Desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. If so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. All right, so let's go back to verse 23. We've already looked at verse 22, um, and we were in verse 23 last time, so let's pick it up where we left off. The Spirit of God uses the incorruptible seed of the the Word of God to give the new birth to those that believe it. Now get that straight. Some people teach that a man must be regenerated in order to believe. That's Calvinism. They, they actually believe and teach that you can't believe the Word of God unless you're first born again. 
No, you are born again, he said, by the incorruptible seed of the Word of God. You've got to hear the Word and believe the Word. Then, as a result, you are born again. All right, so get the order correct according to the Word of God. Um, the incorruptible seed of the Word of God, of course, in this context, he's talking about uh, the message to Israel that's rooted in prophecy. Um, I think about in Matthew 13, verse 19, Christ talked about the seed that he used in the parable was, he said, the word of the kingdom. And so we understand, we've already looked at this in the context of what he's saying here in this passage. And also you can go to James 1, in verse 18, of his own will begat he us with the word of truth. Uh, you look in the context of that verse, you see that the message has to do with Israel, it's rooted in prophecy. But of course, the same principle applies today because Paul said in Ephesians 1.13, "...in whom you also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise." So the same principle today, the Spirit of God, when you hear the gospel, the grace of God, and you trust Christ that He died for your sins, was buried, and rose again, put all your trust in Him... You are regenerated and sealed with the Spirit upon believing the incorruptible seed of the Word of God. So it's got to do with the incorruptible seed. He said, not of corruptible seed. That would be the flesh. The flesh is corruptible and can only be corruptible. So being a physical Jew does not grant eternal salvation and entrance into the kingdom of God. We looked at this last time in John 1. He said, which were born, I believe it's verse 13, John 1, 13, which were born, not of blood, nor of the will of, uh, of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. Okay? So it's not an issue, well, I'm a Jew, I'm going into the kingdom, I have eternal life, not without believing God. Without faith, it's impossible to please Him. That's, that's a principle in every age. And so, Jesus Christ, we'll look at this verse in just a moment, but He said, the flesh profiteth nothing. Is that, does that, is that not true in every dispensation? Is that not true in every age? The flesh of man profits nothing. And so they're going to have to become partakers of the divine nature if they're going to escape the corruption in the world through lust. Look over in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse number 4. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 4. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature. And being born again, you have the Spirit of God in you. You're a partaker of His divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. John said in 1 John 2 that uh, he said, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. He said, Because all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Now, in this present age, if, if you love the world, you'll be worldly. You won't please God. You'll lose reward at the judgment seat of Christ. But in the future 70th week, if you love the world, you're going to wind up taking the mark of the beast and lose your soul. <laughs> okay, that's pretty serious. And so, he said, if they, look, if they're going to have any ability to escape the corruption as in the world through lust, it's going to be because they're partakers of the divine nature. Okay, that's the issue. So, um, let me make this crystal clear. The works of the flesh cannot accomplish salvation in any age. Because it's not of corruptible seed. The flesh can only be corruptible. The flesh cannot do works that please God. What pleases God is faith. Okay, that's the issue. Doing works without faith is just dead works. And so a man is never saved by the works of his flesh in any age. 
That would contradict the moral character of God. God does change in His dealings with man, but not in His person and in His righteousness and His moral principles. How could God Almighty ever look at any man and say, so on the basis of the works of your flesh, I'll justify you. And the fact is, Jesus said, the flesh profits nothing. Paul said, in my flesh dwells no good thing. All the righteousness of a man's flesh is as filthy rags in the sight of God. He said, well, under the law, they had to do some works by faith. If they weren't doing it from a sincere heart of faith, those works meant nothing to God. Read Isaiah chapter 1 for an example and see what God thought about the Jews going through the motions of their religion without a real heart of faith and repentance. He said their whole worship was sin. I mean, just in other words, the faith is always the issue. So th there has to be this new birth because the kind begets kind. Jesus said, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. The flesh can only bring forth corruption. That's all it can do. So there's no way a man... That, look, Nicodemus, when Jesus said you must be born again, when he was talking to Nicodemus, you're talking about a religious man. But no matter how religious you make the flesh, it will not change the corruption of that flesh. And so regeneration is not reformation of the old nature. It's a divine nature. It's a new birth. Okay? And by the way, the Lord Jesus said, you must, <laughs> you must be born again. No man will see the kingdom of God unless he's born of the Spirit of God. It's an absolute necessity, must. All right, so back to 1 Peter 1 here, where he says, it's um, by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. Both are true forever. The word of God lives the Word of God abides forever. Both are forever. Okay? And I pointed this out already, but modern versions, most of them are going to take out those words forever. Can you imagine that? They take out the words forever. That's key right there. You see, because there are some people who say, well, the Bible's still around, but it's not inspired anymore. It's inspired forever. That's what liveth means. It's inspired of God. It's got the Spirit of God in the words and on the words using the words. Spiritual life in the words. Inspiration. You know, the scholars will say that's theonustos, which means literally God breathed. That's how they say it real dramatic-like, you know. And what they want to do is they want to limit it to the original giving. But if you look at the word inspiration, you see spirit right there in the, in the middle of the word. And it's the fact that the words are spiritual words from God. And God gave those words and they're still around. They, they will abide forever. Okay, so look in John 6. Keep a mark here in 1 Peter. Look in John 6. In verse number 63. I've alluded to this several times. Let's look at the verse. John 6, verse 63. The Lord Jesus said, It is the Spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are Spirit. And they are life. The words of God are spiritual words. They are living words. Jesus Christ is the Word of God. So when you talk about the Word of God incarnate and you talk about the inspired Word, there are many of the same titles and attributes to both. You can only know the Father through the Word of God, Jesus Christ. He reveals and declares the Father. You can only know the Son through the Word of God, the Holy Scripture, because it reveals and declares the Son. You see, the Spirit inspired and preserved these words to glorify the Son, and the Son came to glorify the Father. Okay, He said they are Spirit and they are life. Um, look in um, 
Matthew 5. And while you're finding that, let me give you some other verses here. I'm not going to turn to all of these, but I'll quote them to you. You're familiar, I'm sure. All right, so let's, let's talk just a minute about inspiration. That means the Word of God liveth. And then preservation, it abideth. Okay? Both are true forever. All right, as far as inspiration, uh, Paul said, holding forth the Word of life. Philippians 2.16. Did you know Jesus Christ is called the Word of life? 1 John 1. Paul was talking about the Scripture in Philippians 2.16. Word with a capital W is Jesus Christ. John calls him that seven times. In the Gospel of John, the Epistles of John, and Revelation, a total of seven times. Uh, but the lowercase w, the Word, that's the, the Scripture. Paul said the Word of life. Uh, I already quoted it, but let me do it again. All Scripture, at least I referred to it. Let me give you the verse. You know it. You ought to know it. I quote this all the time, don't I? And for good reason. You want to know why I always quote 2 Timothy 3.16? Because all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. All Scripture. Is, not was. And people say, no, that's just originally. Well, look, in the context, you got Timothy, who from a child had Holy Scripture. He didn't have no original writings. So, based on how it's used in the Bible, you've only got two references to inspiration. The first one is in Job 32, I believe it is, where he said, There's a spirit in man, the inspiration of the Almighty giveth them understanding. Okay, and then in 2 Timothy, Job is the earliest book. 2 Timothy is the last book that was written. All Scripture has now been given. It's given by inspiration of God. Neither one of those references would lead you to believe that inspiration is limited. Okay? And before you start saying, you know, people, what they'll do when I start talking about stuff like that, oh, you're a Ruckmanite. Well, I got news for you. Peter Ruckman was born, I guess, in the, uh, I think he was born in the 20s. Okay, now I have in my office, because Peter Ruckman taught the King James Bible was the inspired words of God in the English language, and I believe that, but that doesn't mean I agree with everything he taught, and I didn't get that position from him. I got it from the book in my hand, the Word of God. But just for your information, people always say that started with Ruckman. No, it didn't. I got a book in my office. I would bring it out here, but it'd probably fall apart so old. But it was a, a series of lectures taught by a man in the university in Dublin, Ireland in 1840 that taught about inspiration, what I'm talking about tonight. All right, so there it is. It's not, in other words, but here's the main thing. It's in the Word of God. We, what we believe about it is in the Word of God. That's the issue. That's like people say, well, dispensationalism started with Darby. Not if I can show it to you in the Word of God. Okay. And so neither one of those references in Job or 2 Timothy would lead you to believe you don't have inspired Scripture today. Uh, if you just believe what the Bible says about itself, you would believe that there's a perfect copy of the Scripture somewhere. Because God gave it and He promised to keep it pure forever. And He has. Ephesians 6.17 says, uh, The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Okay, so how is it the sword of the Spirit unless it's inspired? Again, spiritual words. It's got to be a living book. A living sword of the Spirit. Um... Hebrews 4.12, the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. He said, of joint and marrow. And let me read the verse. I always stumble right in the middle of that verse. That joint and marrow part gets me every time. Let me read it to you. Because I want to read the next verse too. Listen to this. I told you, Matthew, and I meant it. We'll be there in, you know, sometime. Uh... Hebrews 4.12, for the Word of God is quick. Now, someone said, well, that just means it's alive. Well, it is alive, but it's more than that. It's, a, it's active. Paul said, I'm bound, but the Word of God's not bound. You can't, you can't bind the Word of God. It's very active. The Word of God is quick. It's alive, but you can be alive and not very active. Okay. No, let me use any of you as illustration. <laughs> But the Word of God is very active. Okay, all right. The Word of God is quick and powerful, sharpening a two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and, okay, the joints of marrow follow that. All right. And of the joints. That's very precise. A lot of people think soul and spirit's the same. There's actually a distinction. The Word of God can pierce to the dividing asunder of it. And of the joints of marrow. 
and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in His sight. It's talking about God and His Word like it's the same thing. Okay? Uh, I mean, you can't know God but through His Word. And if you attack the Word of God, you're attacking God. You can't separate the incarnate Word and the inspired Word. It's a living book. Um, the Word of God said to Pharaoh. The Scripture said to Pharaoh. And now it says in Galatians, the Scripture, or in Romans 9. In Romans 9, the Scripture saith to Pharaoh. And um, in Galatians, there's another reference like that where it talks about I'm just trying to tell you that it's a living book, man, okay? It's, it's not a dead book of words. Um, and the Scripture for seeing, that's what I'm thinking about. The Scripture for seeing, and the Scripture hath concluded, says in Galatians. It's a living book. All right. It abideth. That means it's, it's always going to be here. Once God gives it, it's settled. And it will be preserved. Um, Psalm 12, verse 6 and 7 says, The words of the Lord are pure words. As silver trying to furnace of earth purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Okay. Um, that's clearly talking about God preserving His words in the earth. Because the point of the Bible is reveal God to man. Somebody told me, no, God's word settled in heaven. That's the only place there's a perfect copy. Well, if the purpose of the Bible is to real, reveal God to man, why would he make the book and then leave it in heaven where man can't have it? And, hey, the word of God is not being attacked in heaven. It needs to be preserved on earth. Because Satan is after it. Paul said in his day, there were many which corrupted the word of God. Now, there are corrupt translations out there. There are corrupt manuscripts. There are corruptions, but they're still a pure book. Because God said He would preserve it from this generation. That's got to do with the earth. There's no generations in heaven. From this generation forever. All right, Matthew 5. Verse number 18. We'll back up verse 17 here and get a run start. Think not that Jesus said, Think not that I'm come to destroy the law of the prophets. I'm not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Which means he conducted his entire ministry under the law. Else how would he fulfill it? For verily I say unto you, Till heaven and earth shall uh, pass, one jot or one tittle. That's the smallest markings in the Hebrew. Shall in no wise pass from the law. To all be fulfilled. Well, there are things in the law that are yet to be. Now, Christ fulfilled the law, but there are things prophesied in the law that still haven't been fulfilled. So that means it must be kept. It must be preserved because there are things still to be fulfilled. Matthew 24. Matthew 24. Now, this is what Jesus Christ had to say. And by the way, when you look at Jesus Christ and His ministry, He never one time cast doubt on the Scripture that was available to the people of His day. And they didn't have the originals. Okay, the, God let the original writings perish because He didn't need them because he, he preserved them in copies. Jesus Christ never cast a doubt. He always upheld the written Scripture that was available to the people as being the authoritative Word of God. It was, it's the devil that's always saying, if. And what about this? And what about that? And playing games with doubting the Word of God. Um, Matthew 24, verse 5. Excuse me, not verse 5. Verse 35. Heaven and earth shall pass away. But my words... Notice that. Words. Somebody said, well, the, you know, the, the basic thoughts are preserved. You know, the, the doctrines. Well, I got news for you. Doctrines made up of words. And if you mess with the words, you mess up the doctrine. But Jesus didn't say, my thoughts shall not pass away. He did not he didn't say, my doctrine shall not pass away. He said, my words shall not pass away. Okay, so where are they? Now here's the thing about it. If you go back to 1 Peter 1 now, here's the thing about it. He's saying these people, and we've already shown you, Peter is not only writing to some Jews in the first century, but prophetically to Jews in the future 70th week of Daniel. 
And they've got to have an incorruptible seed to be born again. Which, by the way, let me just stop and deal with this, because I know somebody's thinking this. There are some people who say, well, you nut, you believe that a person can't get saved without a King James Bible. Well, what I believe is, is even the new versions have some pure truth in them. Okay? So a person can get saved by believing the gospel, even with it's a new version. But once they're saved, would you tell your baby to go eat in the trash can somewhere, or would you try to provide the best food possible? Okay, I mean, you can, anybody can get some scraps out of a trash can. You're going to get some things out of a new version, but the, the pure Word of God, that's what you need. So, no, so yes, there is gospel truth even in the new versions, but they've got a lot of other problems in it, so you want to you know, reject those and get rid of those and not go by those. It'll eventually lead to problems. But uh, at any rate, the thing is, is these people are going to have the incorruptible in the future. Now look in verse 3 of chapter 2. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the Word. Well, that sincere milk is talking about pure, unadulterated, unmixed milk of the Word. So people in the future from where we live right now are guaranteed by God to have incorruptible and pure words from God. So if they're going to have it in the future, why can't we have it now? We do have it now. We have it in the English language in the King James Bible. Okay? Now, that's absolutely essential. Um, see, the foundation is the Word of God. And if you don't believe you have a perfect Bible, a living Bible, I'm talking about a real living Bible, not the corrupt translation, but the living Word of God. I mean, that, I can't overemphasize the importance of that. Once you begin to doubt the Word of God and become your own authority, picking and choosing what you like among the versions, you're headed for apostasy. This is, this is of the utmost importance. Now, we're living in a Gentile age. Now, individual Jews can get saved today, but predominantly it's the Gentiles that are coming into the body of Christ. There are Jews that believe also, of course. But predominantly, this is a Gentile age. Paul was the apostle of the Gentiles. Would it make sense that God would preserve his words in the Gentile language that most people in the world know, which is English? <laughs> All right, I can run the rabbit. That's not really a rabbit. That's a big deal, but we've taught on these things before. Uh, so I'll move on here in the text. But it's just important we understand that we have the Word of God which liveth and abideth. Both are true forever. Because the spiritual and living Word of God gives life and nourishes life. When you believe the gospel in the Word of God, that's what fa faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. When you believe the Word of God, it, the Spirit of God uses that to give you spiritual life. And then if you're going to grow as a Christian, you, it, you must be nourished in the Word of God. Look at verse 24 and 25. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is a flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the Word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the Word which by the Gospel is preached unto you. Now Peter's quoting from Isaiah chapter 40. You can turn back there if you'd like. Isaiah chapter 40. And it's interesting that the context of what he's quoting is a prophecy about John the Baptist. And what's John the Baptist? What did he preach? The gospel of the kingdom. Okay. Now let me show you something here. Look at Isaiah 40. And verse number 6, the voice said, remember John the Baptist, a voice crying in the wilderness. The voice said, cry. And he said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass. And all the goodliness thereof is as the flower of the field. I mean, the, the flesh of man is as weak and as temporal as grass. And the best a man can produce on his best day might be like a little flower sprouting up. But guess what? That don't last either. He said, The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, because the spear of the Lord bloweth upon it. Surely the people is grass. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Alright, so when Peter quotes this, 
he, he follows it up by saying, and this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Now Peter's writing to the circumcision. And he already talked about back in verse 12 how uh, the prophets did not minister to themselves, but they spoke of things, he said, which are now reported unto you by them that preach the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven. Uh, that's got to do with what happened in early Acts. That's got to do with the gospel of the kingdom. And so if you look here in Isaiah 40, look at verse 9. Isaiah 40, verse 9. O Zion, that bring us good tidings. That means gospel. Gospel is good tidings. Get thee up into the high mountain, O Jerusalem, that bring us good tidings. Lift up thy voice with strength. Lift it up. Be not afraid. Send to the cities of Judah. Behold your God. When Christ sets up His kingdom, that's God putting His kingdom on the earth. Behold, the Lord God will come, that's the second coming, with strong hand, and His arm shall rule for Him. Behold, His reward is with Him, and His work before Him. He shall feed His flock like a shepherd. Jesus said, I'm not sent but the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He said, I'm the good shepherd. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and shall gently lead those that are with young. So he's talking about this good news of God coming and reigning and ruling and taking care of his people. That's the gospel of the kingdom. It's rooted right here in prophecy. Okay? So, you know, he's comparing... He's comparing the flesh of man and the best man can do with, with, with grass and the flower of the field. And I'm not going to run all these references, but there's a, there's a number of them, especially in Psalms. Get a concordance and look it up. It's, it's many times the Bible compares man to just grass. That's how weak we are. That's how temporal we are. Okay, but look in James chapter 1. I've got some references here written down from Psalms, but you can, you got a concordance, right? You got a search program. Check it out. They're in there. Let me give you James 1. Verse 9. Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted, but the rich in that he's made low. All through James, he talks about a rich man like he's evil. Because under the gospel of the kingdom, they had to sell all, give to the poor. A man that was rich, was, it was an indication he didn't believe the message. He said, but the rich in that he's made low, because as the flower of the grass, he shall pass away. For the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withereth the grass, and the flower thereof falleth, and the grace of the fashion of it perisheth. So shall the rich man fade away in his ways. Now, if you were to go back to Malachi 4, for an example, the day of the Lord, it comes like an oven, <laughs> and the sun of righteousness arises, and there's going to be destruction to the flesh of man, but there's going to be the setting up of His eternal kingdom. Okay, so this especially has it reference in with the, um, the, the baptism with fire, the fiery judgment that comes at the second coming of Christ. Well, look in Acts chapter 12. Let me show you something. Acts chapter 12. So he said on the one hand, he said the, you have the flesh of man, it's just grass, and the best he can do is like a little flower. But the Word of God endures forever. And Satan can attack it all he wants, and men can attack it all they want. It ain't going nowhere. It stands. Okay? So why in the world would you want to live for, for temporal things that are all going to fade away when you can live for eternal things based on the Word of God? You build your life on the Word of God, that's eternal. Everything you do in your flesh for your flesh is all going to fade away. Look at Acts chapter 12. This is a great illustration of this whole thing. Comparing the Word of God with man's flesh. In Acts chapter 12 verse 21, And upon a set day, Herod, this king, who thought he was really something, arrayed in royal apparel, 
sat upon his throne and made an oration unto them. And the people gave a shout, saying, It is the voice of a God and not of a man. And he said, Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty good, all right. The best he, I mean, this is a king in all of his glory, with his best clothing on his throne, with power, and he speaks so well. And they all say, oh, he's a God. Well, verse 23, immediately the angel of the Lord smote him because he gave not God the glory and he was eaten of worms. That's the flesh. It's all going to perish. It's all going to fade away and gave up the ghost. But the Word of God grew and multiplied. <laughs> you know, that moron um, named uh, Nietzsche, wasn't that his name? There's, all, there's been a number of morons like that. In, they call them infidels. They ought to call them in for hills. But they attack the Word of God and they laugh at the Word of God and say, we're going to get rid of the Word. And they all die. And the Word of God keeps going. <laughs> Voltaire. I think we're talking about how he was going to get rid of the Scriptures. And I've been told, I haven't really done the research to see if it's so, but it makes a good story, so I'm going to say it and act like it's so. <laughs> Because if I find out it's not so, then I have to quit using the illustration. But as far as I know, it is so that they, uh, a Bible society got a hold of his house and used it to store Bibles. <laughs> After he died, <laughs> here is the man who was going to supposedly get rid of the Word of God. You can't get rid of the Word of God. Can you imagine man with all his pride, thinking he can correct the Bible and get rid of the Bible and do whatever he get. The attack on the Bible is constant, but it's, it's here and, and it's going. In King James English, it's going no wither. <laughs> okay? All right. Back in chapter 2 of 1 Peter. Verse 1. Wherefore... Laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envyings and all evil speakings. Now, this is a high standard. He says all, all, all. Get rid of it all. Lay it all aside. Malice. Wanting to do evil to others. Guile with that duplicity and deceit. Hypocrisies. Pretending to be something you're not while you're envying and speaking evil. He said, lay it aside. Being born again, they have the power through the Holy Spirit to lay aside the sins of the flesh. Hebrews 12.1 says, um, Wherefore, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and run with patience the race set before us. In other words, there's things you better lay aside if you're going to Especially in this context, if you're going to endure to the end, you better lay these things aside. Um, in fact, James, when he talked about in chapter 1 about being uh, of his own will begat, he us with the word of truth, he said in that context in verse 21, wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness. That's overflowing and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. So they better lay these things aside. And if you look at it in verse 1, these things are contrary. Look, look at verse 22 again of chapter 1. Seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through, un, uh, through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. That's what they're going to do through the Spirit. That being born again, having the divine nature, that's what they can do. Well, the things in chapter 2, verse 1 are, are contrary to unfeigned love. Okay? Unfeigned love, the real thing, charity. Um, if you have that, you're not going to have malice and guile and hypocrisy and envy and evil speaking. That's all of the flesh. That's all of the flesh. Lay those things aside. James chapter 4, verse 11, he said, um, Speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judgeth his brother speaketh evil of the law and judgeth the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and destroy. Who art thou that judgest another? And you can run a lot of references on this, but I think it's clear 
they're going to have to lay these things aside. Now, as far as an application to us today, I'm not going to go there, but if you were to go to Ephesians 4 and Colossians 3, you find Paul saying and teaching, put off the old man, put on the new. Okay? In other words, when you got saved, you were taken out of the old man, the flesh. You were put in the new man, the body of Christ. But he teaches you need to walk that way. The deeds of the old man, put those things off. Put on the new. It's a similar idea. In other words, now that you belong to God, the things of the flesh, you need to put them off. Well, Peter said laying aside. It's the same idea. Well, there's a principle there. And you can go back and look at what Paul had to teach us about those things. I mean, being saved, we now through the Spirit of God have the power to stop doing those things we ought not and start doing the things that we ought. And we're not going to be sinless. We understand that. But the power is there to do what God would have us do. Well, he said, as newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the Word that you may grow thereby. All right? As newborn babes, desire, desire, desire. That's... Um, Look, the pure Word of God is the food of the new nature. Now, I mean, there's a lot of verses that liken the Word of God to food. It's like milk. It's like meat. It's like bread. It's like water. It's like honey. That's all good stuff. It'll nourish you. The Word of God. The new nature cannot be strengthened by the things of this world, by the things of the flesh. It must be by the things of God and the Word of God. The pure Word of God. He said the sincere milk. That is to say the pure, unmixed, unadulterated Word of God. You ought to desire that, that you may grow thereby. Paul taught similar. He said to, to Timothy in 1 Timothy 4, um, he talked about being nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. Being nourished up spiritually. And then he said, refuse the profane things, the unholy false doctrine, and exercise thyself into godliness. You don't have the power to live for God without being first nourished in the Word of God. Spiritual health. And he said, if so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious... Uh, I think about Psalm 34, 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. How do you do that? Blessed is the man that trusteth in Him. You taste, you experience the things of God by trusting God. I can stand up here all day long and talk about how wonderful the Word of God is, but until you trust it in your own heart and life, it's not going to make a difference in your life that it ought. You've got to taste and see. Now, Hebrews 6 talks about they tasted of the powers of the world to come. Um, the baptism with the Holy Ghost there in the book of Acts as it pertained to the kingdom program, it was a foretaste of that world to come, the kingdom age. They were tasting of that grace of God. Which, by the way, the grace of God is not exclusive to the age of grace. God has grace in every age. And you find grace mentioned 25 times in Hebrews through Revelation. And Peter talks about tasting that the Lord is gracious. And he talks about in chapter 4 the manifold grace of God. And in chapter 5 he talks about uh, the true grace of God wherein they stand. Uh, and I think about what it says in Hebrews 4. Um, Come boldly to the throne of grace that you might find mercy and help in time and need. And so the grace has got to be there for these saints in the future 70th week. Uh, when, the, when the body of Christ is taken up in our blessed hope and we're removed, that doesn't mean the grace of God no longer exists. It's going to be God's grace that gets His people through the tribulation. Now there's degrees to it and there's some distinctions and all of that, but Peter had something to say. And remember, we've already looked at it in chapter 1 where he talked about how they're going to be saved by the grace of God a prophesied grace that would come unto them. Okay? Taste and see that the Lord is gracious if you've really trusted Him. He said, you ought to desire the sincere milk of the Word that you may grow thereby. Peter said, uh, but grow in grace and the knowledge. Grow in grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Peter 3.18 Well, look, how are we going to grow? Paul said in Ephesians 4.15 Speaking the truth in love that you may grow, right? 
That's what he said. He said the same principle. Speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Now, um, the Word of God is, is key, but then also rightly dividing the Word of God to understand where you're living and what God is doing. <laughs> There's some distinctions between doctrines Paul taught us under grace and what Peter's teaching the circumcision in the 70th week of Daniel. But it's still the Word of God. The Word of God is always key. Um, I'm finding a stopping place here. Let's, let's, as we close tonight, think about this word desire. As newborn babes desire. A Christian's desire for the Word of God should come just as naturally as a baby's desire for its mother's milk. We had a new calf this morning. We didn't have to teach him to get some milk. <laughs> I, we didn't have the calf. The cow had the calf. Okay, I just want to clarify that. <laughs> it's, I, mean, I mean, right out of the chute, man, they're going after that milk. And they got to have it. And they desire it. And that's how they're going to grow. And if the calf, if something's wrong with the milk supply, you're going to have a problem. You're going to have to go buy some and get it done because if he doesn't have that milk, he can't grow up, right? A, ba a newborn baby, if it doesn't have its mother's milk, if it doesn't have the right nourishment, it can't be healthy. It can't grow. And so I tell you what, a loss of appetite is a sure sign of poor health. Something's wrong when you don't have appetite. Something's very wrong with a Christian who doesn't care about the Word of God. And, and, and when you desire the Word of God, you desire to study it for yourself, but you desire to hear it preached, and you desire to hear it taught. You, you want to hear it taught. Peter said in 1 Peter 5, he talked about the elders. He said, feed the flock. And, and, and in Jeremiah 3, it prophesied that God one day is going to give Israel finally those pastors after His own heart who would feed them with knowledge and understanding. And if you can go to a place where you can hear the Word of God taught so that you can know and understand the Lord and the things of the Lord, and you have no desire for that, there's something wrong there. Okay? And, and I'm not saying a person's not saved. It may be they're just so carnal that they're already full of the things of the world. The full soul loatheth in a honeycomb. A honeycomb is good, but if you're already full, you've got no room for it. So it says in Proverbs 27, 7. So if you're filled up with the things of the flesh and the things of the world, you're not going to have a desire for the Word of God. So we need to get nourished up in the Word of God. We ought to have an appetite to read the Bible, to study the Bible, to meditate in the Bible, to hear it taught, to hear it preached. There ought to be a desire. You know, that's, that's the key word there. Not, okay, I gotta go. I'm religious, so I'm going to go to church. That's not going to help you. Just to come sit in a chair and then walk out the door like nothing ever happened. You've got to have a desire to receive and taste the Word of God. Well, we begin with milk. That's, you know, look, in Hebrews, let's, real quick, I'm almost done. I forgot about this. Look at Hebrews 5. Real quick, real quick, real quick. The milk is likened unto the simpler things the meat to the deeper and harder things. you got to start with milk before you can digest meat, okay? But there ought to come a point where you get to the meat. And when you get to the meat, that doesn't mean you forget the milk. You have both. Hebrews 5, 12, For when, the time, for when for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles, the oracles of God, or become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he's a babe. And that's okay if you're newly saved. But there comes a point you need to move on to the meat. And, and, and if when you should be eating meat, you can't handle it, then you're stagnant, and that's a problem. You're not growing. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use. They're not just what you learn, but what you believe and what you uh, obey have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Now, Paul taught similar in 1 Corinthians 3. He told the carnal Corinthians, I fed you with milk and not with meat because you're not able to bear it. If you, if you, if you can't handle the meat of the words because you're carnal, it's either you're a new Christian, you're newly saved, or you're just not growing. But when you're growing, you can move on to the meat. And 
spiritual growth happens at the rate you take in the Word of God. Now you're complete in Christ. In this age, we're complete the moment we believe. But there's a process, practically speaking, of learning and growing and what it means to be in the body of Christ. There's, a spiritual, there's spiritual growth in this age. There's spiritual growth even for those in the 70th week. And by the way, we won't turn there. We might look at it another time in another lesson. But you can check 2 Peter chapter 1 where he keeps talking about add this and add that and add the other thing as far as the growth is concerned for them. He said which ultimately leads to an abundant, abundant entrance into the kingdom. So what we looked at tonight is there's a great contrast between the eternal Word of God and the temporal flesh of man. And whereas Peter's obviously talking about the kingdom program of Israel in the 70th week and the second coming, there are certainly applications we can get out of this. Certainly we ought to put off the things of the old man. Certainly we ought to desire the Word of God so that we can grow and walk in the new man. And you can't grow spiritually without the Word of God. That's, why, that's what we serve up here. Anybody who wants to grow as a Christian will find plenty of opportunity at Hope Bible Church. But it's up to you to receive it. You know, you can sit there and hear it all day long, but if you don't take it in and taste and see, uh, you've got to learn to digest. Hey, I can feed it to you, but I can't digest it for you. Right? You've got to learn to take it in and die. And I'm sure you do. That's why you're here tonight. But this is the Word of God. Aren't we glad we have an incorruptible, pure book? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Father, thank you tonight for the Bible.